inside everything. Everything. Out and then we'll be off and running. Perfect. Thanks. All right. Welcome back to another episode of the Strategy Inside Everything. We have a big show today. We have a studio audience packed to the rafters <laughs> here. You uh, uh -oh. prepare. We're going to have a laugh track going. It's going to be the real deal here today. Um, and I'm excited because we have the SVP and Chief Marketing Officer at RPA, Mr. Tim Leak. Tim, how are you? I'm doing great, Adam. Thank you for having me. Tim, I think you were one of the first five people I invited onto this show. And now we're in, the, <laughs> we're in episode 30. So I'm glad oh. that we were finally able to work it out. Well, thank you for, for making me one of the first five. That's amazing. And I apologize that it took this long to make happen. And But I was actually super glad to have heard some of the amazing earlier episodes because it's going to make this episode so much better. Well, I raised the bar for you. If you would have called earlier, it would have been like, hey, just say whatever you want. But now <laughs> there's been a lot of really good episodes and content. you got to live so. up to all the good ones. Exactly. There's a, there's a lot of buildup now. So, Tim, uh, normally I like people to... Um, Give the listeners a background, a little bit of you know what you've done and where you've been, and, and in your case, that's going to play into a bigger part of the conversation. But if you could give them a, an overview, we'll we'll dive in and I'll start uh, peppering you with questions. Uh, sounds good. Well, I mean, we're what we're here to talk about today is change in general, and um, so my background, I've worked in advertising for. It's something like 22 years, a little longer than that, actually. And uh, I got my start on the, the creative side of this industry at Shite Day here in Los Angeles. And I was a copywriter. Um, a, I, I've worked at a couple other agencies. I freelanced for a while. And then I was at Sachi and Sachi in New York as a creative director. Uh, and, then I, and then I pivoted and I left the advertising world for uh, just a couple of years. And I, I had started speaking with and then eventually went to work full time for a Swedish company called Hyper Island that is a training organization. They're a school in Sweden, but in, in the States, it's, it's more of a training consultancy. We, we created bespoke trainings basically to help people deal with change. And then did that for a few years. And I do still speak with them, by the way. They're still a great company. And uh, but but from a full time job, uh, one of my clients was a, an agency called RPA here in Santa Monica, and um, we created a different sort of role that I could come out here, and that was to uh, basically own the marketing of of the agency and uh, and how could we help build ourselves to be what we need to be in the future and be what's right for in a changing marketplace uh, to be what's right for our clients, uh, both existing and new. So I, I now oversee our, our marketing, our new business. Uh, um, we, we have a great PR team, um, as well as uh, being on the executive team that just tries to help us get where we need to go. Nice. And I have to tell you, living in Santa Monica really sucks. Yeah, it's, it's terrible. It's actually, pretty, terrible weather. it's actually pretty awesome. You know, I'm surprised. It doesn't yeah. sound like you've been here. Um, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's beautiful out yeah. today. It's like sunny and breezy and Perfect. Every single day? Yeah, every single day. I mean, coming coming from New York, where they're in the middle of another heat wave, it went straight from winter to summer there this year. I was there oh. for 10 years, and I don't miss it that much. Um, no, be perfectly definitely honest. not the weather. I love change, but not not so much in the weather. Yeah, no kidding. 72 and sunny is pretty great. <laughs> it's a pretty perfect name for an agency based here. Yeah, no shit. Let's talk about, um, let's talk about change. So you and I have talked about this a couple times. Uh about being at Hyper Island and kind of having a revelation of of what it was because I think when Hyper Island my understanding of it and correct me if I if I either misunderstood the marketing materials or <laughs> um, just have a wrong impression but it was like hey there's a lot of traditional marketers out there and a lot of traditional advertising people out there Hyper Island is a place where you can kind of be immersed in digital thinking for whatever length of time and then you come out uh, understanding those things a lot better. Yeah, that's probably a, a good representation of what the marketing materials said. And it, what's interesting about Hyper Island is, you know, you have to sell, you have to sell what people want, but then you want to give them what they need. And what I always find fascinating about Hyper is, is you're selling on this idea of, hey, people feel like they don't understand digital and they need to figure out what digital is and how to understand that. What, what Hyper gives people is, is an understanding of change and it's changed through a digital lens. But why that's important is that the, my, my first interaction with Hyper Island was nearly 10 years ago at this point. And 
you know, I remember shortly after that, we were all we were all really excited to get our beta invitations to Google Wave, if you remember what that was. Right. And remember, it's, yeah. you know, it, it actually kind of was like Slack, but uh, it was beforehand and it didn't it didn't succeed at all. And there's been so many things that have come and gone and come and gone and changed in that landscape over just the last 10 years that to have done anything where we were talking about the best practices of whatever digital was at that moment that that's pointless. Right. And whereas if, if you can create a, a learning mindset and, and, and the ability within people to simply adapt to change and to be really curious and to try new things and to quickly get good at them, then you're always going to be on the cutting edge. And that's, that's basically what Hyper Island as a school and as a training program has always been about. So it's, I think become a little trickier now that there isn't as much thirst for digital training, I think, as there was, you know, five to 10 years ago, but there's certainly still a need for change uh, management. Is it more about, is it more about flexibility now? I mean, from your, forget Hyper Island, but mm -hmm. from, from your point of view, Tim, is it, is it more about flexibility and kind of plasticity of your mind to be able to jump, you know, jump streams and think about things in a different yeah, way? Yeah, I like that. I like that word plasticity that you just used. I think that's better than flexibility because flexibility, I, I guess, it, you know, to me, it implies that I'm open-minded to something. Plast plasticity, yeah. There you go. <laughs> there was an extra S. Plasticity. Thank you. I, it didn't sound right to me. Um, this plasticity <laughs> um, is is much more about um, allowing your mind maybe to reshape itself and and evolve and 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 be malleable. And I think that's what's different mm -hmm. is we've. You know, as we go through our careers, we develop a certain set of muscle memory and we're used to doing things the same way. And in particular, if the way we've been doing those things has been successful for us, we are disincentivized to want to change that. And 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 yet yep. the change is going to happen in the world no matter what. And it's it's very it, it, the weird thing about change is not things don't change equilaterally. Things don't change the same something changes over here and that has a ripple effect on, on things over here. And so a lot of times you have to look at stuff that sort of looks the same. I, I, I like to just use TV commercials as an example because TV commercials functionally look the same. They still run in between commercial breaks on a television show that you're usually watching on TV. And I, I mean, I mean actual TV commercials, not just online video, actual TV commercials. And yet right, right. the way that the audience responds to them today is in a completely different context than what we had before. We have different technology, uh, both with to skip the commercial or to distract ourselves while the commercial is on, or we simply have trained ourselves to ignore it. What, what, what it well, how it works is different. So that's that's why we have to think of it through a slightly different lens. And yet it's not actually a lot different than it used to be. Does that make sense? No, the, me the mechanics of it are the same, but it's the way it's received or not, not received, I guess, is what's really changed the, the culture and the acceptance to the idea of the commercial. It seems like much more of a tax now than it did uh, when, when we were starting yeah, out. Yeah, for sure. And so I guess that's, that's what's fascinating is so you have to be, um, you, you know, your mind has to be malleable about what makes for a good commercial and and what's changed about that and you have to be constantly looking for for how that evolves and how to challenge yourself and i think you know it's it's actually a fairly logical step to go from being a creative to this sort of this sort of mindset and i, I i'm also fascinated by your transition from moving from a creative director to a strategy director and and because I think there's similar sort of things we have to challenge. You have to be creative about this and you have to be curious. And I think all the best creative people are curious and they want, they want to challenge themselves around it. Uh, I see the best creative people because there are some creative people who just like pretty pictures um, and, and, and want to make, you know, pretty things, but that's, that's not the job we have yeah. to do. <laughs> we have to be, you know, no. I, I like to say, we, you know, we create solutions. We don't just create ads. We create solutions. We, we need to be creative about everything we do um, from the strategy to the execution to how we place it out there in the world, um, all aspects of that. There's no room for just creating ads anymore. I mean, I, I don't think there it makes sense for business to be making ads. It, ha it has to tie in to something greater and 
means something as a connection between the consumer and culture and the brand. Otherwise, it's, you're just it, you're really just pushing yeah, pixels and, around. Yeah, and the, you know the funny thing is, and sort of the older I get, the more I realize that there's always an exception to every single rule. I mean, certainly there's going to be some brands that you could just make commercials for, and that would probably be strategically sufficient. Um, and I say yeah. brands, it might be well, more true, true about a, a certain products, right? Um, because they can sell themselves that simply, but certainly for most and for most sophisticated brands, you know, brands that are, are, are really heavily commoditized and, or brands that, that, you know, the, they're looking for advertising to provide an unfair advantage because of the creativity for those kind of brands. Yes. Totally true. What you just said. Talk about change. So in, in a CMO role, especially an internal CMO role, the difference between that and the copywriter on one hand is so mm-hmm. different. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there's a lot of similarities where you have to see a problem and distill it down. Um, so for all that's changed in your career, talk to me about some of the things that are, have been somewhat yeah, constant. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so one of the interesting things, I mean, just to talk about the CMO role for a second, because I think I'm probably unlike most people who have that title in an agency. I don't think a lot of people come from a creative background into that role. And I, I don't think I do it the same way probably as a lot of them, you know, for better or worse, uh, there's strengths that I have and weaknesses that I have that others would have. I think one of the, the, the most awesome thing about the agency that I work at now, RPA, is that I think we have a very open uh, point of view to crafting a position around the player. And uh, I always think that's a, I've always believed that that's the right way to do it because everybody has their own strengths. And if we just try to put ourselves into a particular box, that's not going to help. And so I'm able to then approach this role a lot more from a creative mindset because I've been given permission to do that than an, an account director's mindset, which I'm not good at that right i've got i've got i've got other people uh namely account directors um and then some people on my team that they can help uh offset my weaknesses there because i i but i'm much better at thinking conceptually around it at thinking about how everything communicates right and so the similarities to get back to your question between when you're a copywriter and with what i'm doing now is still fundamentally it's it's all about uh, how, how can we use creativity to help communicate something and get people to pay attention it in the role that I have now I'm focused primarily well it's twofold I mean I'm focused primarily on doing that for the agency but of course every time then a new business pitch comes up I'm focused on on how does that uh, how do we tell that story through the lens of of whatever client we're pitching as well right um and you know of course I'm joined by a whole team right you know by that point we we have we have strategy directors and creative directors and everybody else is doing that as well and so we all collaborate on that but it's um it's still the same in in terms of trying to just approach it from from a creative standpoint and a strategic standpoint to go all right what's going to be compelling here how do we choose the right words i'm still a big believer in words i think words really matter um like, oh, God, yeah. you know, one of the things we're, we're a very people centric agency and, um, this has been a belief of mine for a long time, but I've made it a bigger belief here at RPA is they don't like that word consumer you used it a second ago. And it's everybody in the industry uses it, of course, but I don't understand why we don't just use the word people most of the time, because I think the word consumer mm-hmm. dehumanizes the people that we're trying to make an emotional connection with. And, and I find that problematic because to me, words matter and, and so, you know, as a writer by trade, the finding those right words is a big difference. It's easy to sort of know what we're going to say, but then the specific words that you put in the specific order, those matter. And and even in the role now, I'm never quite satisfied, right? Like you come up with whatever whatever we've written on, on the website at the moment about the agency, and I'm never satisfied with it. I'm always changing it. The uh, most dangerous thing is I, I have an admin account to the agency website so I can go ahead and change the copy <laughs> um, <laughs> when, when suddenly I don't like it this week and, and then and then I switch it back next week sometimes. Um, I, I like to call it A-B testing, mm-hmm. but it's really just me changing my mind. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but but there's that's, that's what's similar, right, is um, th- there's still fundamentally, no matter what we're doing, we're, we're about communicating that. And then uh, 
and then inspiring people. I, I hate the word selling too, because I, I don't think we try to sell ideas to the clients, even though that's what we say. It's, it shouldn't be about that. It should be, you know, mutually together finding the right solution. Um, I always like the word inspire better because if, if maybe they aren't seeing the vision that we're seeing, we have to figure out how to inspire clients to, to see what we see in this opportunity and vice versa. We have to train ourselves to see what they see uh, out in the world so that we can, we can really do a good job solving the problems. I've been thinking about it recently as serving it to them. It's not, it's not selling it to them. It's here it is on a platter <laughs> dig in, take it apart and, I, and, you know, digest it, think about it and tell, give us feedback. You know, it's it. interesting because you use the word serve. Jeez, I'm, I'm really being, I'm really being a word nerd today. Um, this is, this is, this is awesome. And I'm not normally like this, but I, but today I am, uh, is actually we've got, we've got a, a, a management philosophy at the agency that we call servant leadership. We don't call it that it's called servant leadership. <laughs> um, and, it's something our CEO practiced a lot, and and as an executive team, we've we've we're working on implementing it throughout because it is a very people centric way of looking at the world. And what what basically, in a nutshell, it's all about as leaders, our job is to serve those who work for us. And if we and that doesn't mean doing what they tell us. Like we're not slaves. It's not slave leadership. It's ser- servant leadership. It's it's paying attention to their needs and how can we as leaders uh, bring what. Uh, our associates need in order to thrive and in order to be successful. I, it's fascinating. There's tons of books out there on the subject, um, and and we have a couple clients who who you know have the same management style as well. And I think it's very unusual actually in the advertising industry. But when you said serve, I I, I interpreted it that way, meaning serve them because it's not about selling them an idea. It's actually, it's our job to give the clients what they need. And so when we serve right, them, exactly. we are giving them what they need. That's not how you meant it. I don't think, <laughs> but, no, it isn't. Uh, but that was a really interesting interpretation of it. I thought it's a, it's a nice yes. And, <laughs> um, well, but I, going back to, uh, words and how important they are. I just, just, just two minutes ago was on a call where uh, I was presenting a brief and the client rightfully were in section one, the audience, <laughs> and they just leaned in on one sentence that was in there describing the audience about a trait. Yeah. And that that's as far as I got in the call because <laughs> it was, it was, that was the rest of the call. They were saying, yeah, they were saying, well, that's not really what this is about. It's not about this one trait. And they were right about that being not necessary to the brief. Right. And so everything else after that was like, well, yeah, okay. I'm just taking notes. I know. Now. Let me see how I can, let me see what I can learn here and make this better. Well, you know, it's funny because it, it's one of the challenges because words do matter. And then, um, you know, you'd have to, I, I'd be curious to get your two cents of this it's, again, especially as a former, a former creative, creative director and, and, and now uh, director of strategy. Um, those words matter, but when the words are in a brief, the, it's like we finely tuned these words to get the words just perfect, but then those aren't the words that end up in the ads. <laughs> in fact, in fact, creatives consider it a failure if they use any of the words that are on the brief in the ad. A lot of time, a lot of time. And so, I'd be curious true. how, how you uh, feel I, about that. I think about it a lot uh, because it the brief is the ad that you're writing to the creative mm-hmm. people or to whoever is going to take that brief and do something with it. And so you have to, it has to be inspiring. And I know that the copywriter, who is probably a word geek and has a seven different thesauruses, thesauri, I'm not sure, uh, it will be taking each word of the single most important idea and taking it apart and saying, well, what if I do something mm-hmm. off of this word? What if I do something off of this? Oh, but it's it's an adjective. It's not this. So maybe I should make it this. <laughs> and if you miss, if you put in a word or a, or a, or the wrong prefix or the wrong suffix on a word or you you conjugate something in a different tense it can take them down a totally crazy different road where it's just like i wasn't paying attention but they took it as meaning something in the past tense and now they're giving me all this stuff that's historical found footage right right versus you know modern so it's amazing where the brain goes that that creative team or the digital team that has to dream up an idea will take they're going to be immersed in that thing for 10 hours or longer, mm-hmm. right? 
So those words really matter when, when somebody is just isolating themselves and, and daydreaming about yeah. it all day. Well, and, and it's an interesting thing too, because you, I've always loved the creative process because there's no right answer. You just keep going and you have to be willing to let ideas die. You have to be willing to let it go. Not that wasn't quite right, but the brief is meant to be the right answer. <laughs> you know what I mean? All the work, all the work is coming off yeah. of that. So, and yet you only get one shot really. Right. Other than a little yeah. going back and forth and, and, or, or tweaking the brief once the creative idea doesn't match it, but everybody loves the creative idea. Sometimes that happens. I'm sure not with you, not with us. Of yeah. course, of course, none no, of us, I would but I've heard that that here. happens. You know, and just on this call that I just use as an example, I did, I am getting another crack at it. And I, when they, when there's a critique of the brief, I do take it as an opportunity to rewrite the thing or to go find some other inspiration to take a round two on it if I can, if, because I know that the work, if I talk someone into taking a brief that they don't love, they're never going to like the work that comes out Mm -hmm. of it. They're going to be resistant to it right off the bat. And it's going to be a nightmare. Um, and that's, that's bad yeah. for everybody. Well, and you know, going back to the whole point of the words matter, the interesting thing is some, very often a creative concept can actually unlock a strategy that couldn't have really been expressed any other way, but then the way that the creative just expressed it, you know? And oh, so um, sometimes that's part of the process too, is there's the brief and then there's this slight evolution or twist on it that becomes all the more powerful for what it is. And, um, you know, that's fascinating because words matter. That wasn't the topic of this, of this chat, but that's, we just ended up. No, no, don't worry. We have, (laughs) we got plenty of time to ramble here. Um, but we were, I started this whole words matter thing by asking Uh, what's the same. So that's one of the things words mattering as a copywriter Mm -hmm. and in your role now definitely matter. And I think, uh, regardless of media that the importance of words and the meaning of what you're trying to convey has never changed, but give me some of the big, the big differences that, um, it doesn't have to be specifically mm-hmm. about your role, but really just you have a good perspective on the industry. You know, how what's different today than than when we were both starting out about the creative process? I don't know if I don't know if anything about the creative process itself is radically different. I mean, of course, of course things have changed. Timeline. I just talked myself out of my original opinion. Timeline is the biggest thing that's changed. <laughs> um you know, obviously that, that is a big thing, right? The, the process is still kind of the same. You think of stuff, maybe that's good, maybe that's not, I don't know. Stuff dies, you bounce it off creative directors, they don't like it, you change it, oh, this is great, they like it. Account account director points out a fatal flaw that nobody else saw before. Ah, crap, we didn't know that. We go back, we fix it, come back. I mean, it's, it's there's a lot of that, right? Lots of stuff dies and that's just the process, right? You have something yeah. and it keeps evolving. Um, It's just... You, you know, I think when we got when, when we started out, you used to have months to work on that and and evolve it and keep coming back in different rounds and and then you go into testing and stuff like that and even if it was accelerated, you usually had a couple of weeks. Whereas right. you know we're, we're talking days and sometimes hours depending on the medium, um, with which you have to get it done. And then there's so many more. Uh, media channels to think about. I don't think that really affects the process, but it certainly affects, um, uh, it affects craft. You you know, if you're the the craftsmanship of writing an ad, whether you're writing a radio ad or a television ad or a print ad, which is all that existed when I got started, uh, broadly speaking, um, there's a craftsmanship. You could get really good at that. And it was, it's not easy to write a 30 second TV spot. People think it is, but almost every junior writer's first work is like you know, the 30 second spots are 45 seconds long or right. and, half, <laughs> and there's too many things and, and all that stuff. And so you, you, you sort of, you, you forget that the end title card actually takes four and a half seconds and you, you assume it's instantaneous. Like you don't have to count that, no. um, all that stuff, right? There's, there's craftsmanship you have to learn. Well, now there are so many other media channels and, and the, to understand the craft of what's going to be, what's, what's the, the, the right compelling way to create a, a video um, that we're going to run in Instagram stories that, that contains a swipe up uh, call to action that then has a little uh, uh, vertically built landing page, you know, to, to entice them. Like 
that's just a, that's an ad format that didn't exist not that long ago. And so we right. quickly try to understand that and what's what works there. But the crafts, it's, it's really hard to become a great craftsman at that because as soon as you do, they change it and something else comes along and there's it's too generalized. So, um, you know, something I think about a lot is, is this this idea of do we is it good to have digital specialists or should everybody understand digital because we just work in the digital world? Right. And I do think personally think having watched it for a while at least the way the world is right now i think it helps when people specialize and can hone their craft on certain platforms whether that makes them a digital specialist or not you know there are unique traits to social platforms and it's changing quickly and if people can become specialists at that and really understand how to craft great content for that that's a different skill set than people who can make really beautiful print ads or posters or right. or whatever um and i think lots of creatives can do lots of those things well but i've I've really met people who do all of those things really well just because they they change so much yeah i've always thought of building a creative department as uh making a net and you're just trying to cover ground with people that can lay across and it's like a hammock that you're trying Mm -hmm. to create and you're just trying to cover as much surface area as you can and this person's skills go this way and this person's skills cross over here and over there uh and it's different people who have a different combination of skills. And I agree with you about, you know, someone who's good at two or three different platforms and generally is a good writer or designer or can code is more useful than trying to have someone who's a generalist with, okay, they have a TV spot, they have a YouTube campaign, they've got a Snapchat uh, lens, they've got this and they've Mm -hmm. got that. So we can pretty much assign them anything. It, It doesn't work that way. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, um, you know, getting back to your question, I think those are some of the different aspects uh, of, th- of things that have changed. Uh, and, and that's just a few of them, obviously, you know, in terms of, of what's different. It's, there's so many little things, but the process is still the same. How we think of it is still the same, but there's just so much more of it and you have to do it so much faster. How do you work with, you're working with new brands on a pitch, you're talking to them and uh, around new business time is when the the CMO at the at the brand or the VP of marketing gets real frisky about wanting to know about whatever the new platforms are mm-hmm. and they're kind of woken up and said oh there's this new thing that our old agency never showed us you know how do you bring them change if they're asking or not asking maybe is even a better example how do you bring that change to them in a way that's productive and not just um, you know shiny new object um you know, I actually think in new business, it's way easier to do it in new business than it is the rest of the time, right? So, I mean, the last four and a half years, I've I've been focused primarily on new business stuff and not not the ongoing servicing of accounts. So there's certainly been a lot of change um, from that standpoint that I haven't been involved with day to day the way that a lot of our, our other teams here have. But um, I, I think there's still generally a truth that, you know, when, when the, the train is going, it's really hard to say, Oh, we need to make this radical change. It's, it's, it's hard to take the time that is needed to be able to focus on that and convince people, Oh yeah, that's, that's what we should do. We should invest in whatever this, this change thing is during a new business pitch. Everything is up for grabs, right? The, the, the relationship is new. Everything is new. And so how do you, how do you, bring it back to just not showing them a shiny object. It's always just that you have to be ruthlessly focused on what are their objectives. I, it's always driven me a little bonkers when, when I get briefs or whether it's a, I mean, a creative brief or a client brief or whatever, where the objectives are fuzzy, um, where they just want to equate a feeling with the brand or whatever. It's like, how will we know if we did that? Like, it's so, so right. it's, or, or whether that mattered, right? It's like dictating the solution, not telling me what the problem is. You know, if, if I'm supposed to make a, a Coke fun, how do I know that fun is the thing that's going to make a difference? Why not, why not give me the challenge of how do we increase Coke sales by 10% or something? And then let's figure that all together. I'm, that's a massive right. oversimplification. It's probably a bad one, but uh, th- the point being is it, you're not going to do any shiny objects. If I know that the goal is to increase sales by 10%, 
I'm not going to bring like a shiny object thing and say, oh, look at this cool virtual reality uh, immersion thing where you're, you're in swimming in Coke or whatever. I'm just going to stick with Coke because they're not a real client of ours. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's like, OK, that's interesting. But why? You know, just simply being engaging isn't the same thing as being engaging and communicating or being engaging and persuasive or, or, or mattering. I like, I like this phrase of advertising that matters because it, it, it works for me on a couple levels. Like it needs to matter to the people. It needs to matter to the audience. Like, Oh, I'm interested in this, but it also has to matter because it, 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 it has an effect. It, it, works <laughs> and and so if you judge it by that yeah, it's right it, it has a meaning yeah it has to matter on both of those things in order to be successful if it's going to communicate everything needs to communicate but people choose to ignore it well now you just have to spend a lot more money in order to make it work if it's really engaging but doesn't isn't persuasive or in, doesn't inspire people to buy that product or service then great but it didn't really do what you wanted it to do I, and again i'm oversimplifying but that that's uh, that's the key. I, I I'm not a big fan of shiny objects. I think it's great to go in and experiment and figure out like what can we do with I don't know a 3D printer or what can we do with um, uh, augmented reality. You know, Magic Leap just just came out. What can we go make on Magic Leap? And we could be the first. We're the first brand to come up with a Magic yeah. Leap integration. Great. So the 18 people with Magic Leap goggles, yeah. I mean, basically, all those are really is is a um, a PR play. You're doing something new because that's going to be newsworthy to a degree. But more often than not, and it's yeah, that's exactly newsworthy it. for the agency and not the brand. I mean, it goes in it goes into Ad Week and somebody does a write up about it and says, well, this creative director and chief technology officer right. came up with this idea and great. Right. You know, so what, that's, what, really that's it. That's the simple, the simple prism. I mean, one of the, the most interesting things I think about uh, the role that I have now versus, uh, uh, you know, when I was a, a copywriter and a creative director and, and to me, it's been very liberating. Um, and, and, you know, in fairness, I get, uh, I have this, I have this, uh, you know, or I had a, a love hate relationship with, with being a creative. There's, there's definitely things I miss about that too. And from an identity perspective, it's, it's not always easy to uh, not be part of the creative department. Um, but I don't miss uh, having to be more concerned about what's in my portfolio than doing what's right for our clients. And unfortunately the, the industry is built. Yep that your portfolio gets you your next job. If you're winning awards, it gets you your next job, it gets you bonuses, gets you promoted. It's, it's all that stuff. And so there is a game that needs to be played in order to thrive in that. You have to pay attention. Yeah, it creates a real, it creates a real conflict of interest for the, the people that are making the creative and for the agency itself that is a lot of times at odds with the yeah. business interest of the client because we're, we're chasing different ends. It, it is. And I, I always struggled with that. And then I felt like, and the, the worst then is when you are actually do, trying your best to care about the client's work and it, it still gets nitpicked or henpecked to death. And then, and then it isn't actually what you feel like should be in their best interest, nor is it good. <laughs> it's like the worst. That, that is the, that is the depressing <laughs> place to yeah. be. And you're like, no, no, you don't understand. I was bending over backwards to help you. I know. It's like, I really just want to help you. I really do. I promise. And they still think you're, you're trying to pull a fast one over. And, and so it, it, there's a real, there's a real problem of trust. And I think if we don't, and, and you know, we make a, a big deal about that at the agency that the, the trust and, and that we have to be able to do these things in the service of our clients, but we believe that great creativity produces massively outsized results like it's a competitive advantage when we're true about that you come up with the right kind of ideas and you don't come up with an idea that's just a shiny object for ad press headlines and ad press is great obviously right. we want that too but it's not just that it yeah. can't be right i want to ask you about something you just said uh, as it relates to your identity mm -hmm. because um part of part of your changing role has meant you've kind of become a little bit of a chameleon. You've changed your your role. And there is such, especially at big agencies and especially famous agencies, I'd put Sachi New York in that category. Uh, 
as a creative director, you're part of a weird, it's not a fraternity, it's not a club, but you are part of a, a pretty elite group mm-hmm. of people. There's not that many people that have the title, although it seems like there's more people today yeah. than there were. Uh, but y- you do have, it's it's like having the varsity jacket or whatever the equivalent is, uh, in whatever the cool brand of headphones right. is today, I guess. You're in that club and you And then when you, you give it up, yeah. A certain yeah, talk to me about what that was like giving that up and 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 when you've been in rooms and thought, oh, I used to do this or I wish I could now step yeah. back into that. And well, and, that. I, and then I want you to comment on the same thing because you, you had a, a similar switch. It's um, it is hard. And I I'm, I'm conscious that it really is identity driven. Right. Like there's just sometimes that I still I, I identify self identify as a creative person. Um, and uh, and then so 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 it's hard when you're not doing that because you then have to defer to the rest of the team, um, the team that people that are, do are doing that job right now. <clears throat> and, and, and it is kind of funny, right? Because if, <laughs> so if I come in and I, 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 I leave new business as part of what I do here and yet I'd never done that before, but I had actually spent 22 years as a creative director. So um, it's, you know, I, I love that I can try new challenges and I'm fascinated by that. And I, I, I love what I'm doing right now. It's fun and it's challenging. And it's interesting and, 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 and all that stuff. But there is still a, a this weird, like internal, uh, uh, ego battle of, um, of feeling bummed that I, I'm not part of that club anymore. And, and it is something to struggle yeah, with weird. a little bit, but at, at the same time, I think I become a stronger person by rising above that and not by, by putting the, the, my sense of power in my job title. I hate job titles. Like my title, actually, when I first, first was evolved a few times, when I first came to RPA, it was the director of growth and innovation. Cause that's what we made up. Um, and then it became the director of creative comma marketing and innovation. And somebody misinterpreted that one time to think it was the director of creative marketing and innovation, which I actually thought that was really cool. <laughs> I should have stuck with that. Um, but the problem is nobody ever knew what it meant. Like, it, you know, it's just, it's, it's just hard. There's a period when I was working for Hyper Island where I just went without a title for six months because I hated all the different titles. Um, and that was hard too. I know, but you have to be able to describe I know. what you're, what you're I doing. Know. Though, so, you know? So, so, so it's all weird. And, um, y- you know, I, I like the title I have now. It's, it sounds important and all that, but at the same time, um, it, people tend to project what they assume it is because it might be how somebody else it's, it's not a role that is the same by any stretch of the imagination from agency to agency. I know a lot of people who do what I do and they're all very different people. Yeah. But that's true about creative director too. I mean, I've had, and you I'm sure have had so many different types of creative directors that behave in different ways or have different expectations for you. It, it, it's the role kind of gets yeah. uh, put into a, I think the job is the same. Like they're they're, the way they approach it might be different, but the job is fundamentally the same as a creative director for the most part. Where, yeah, you you know, this any anybody, yeah, can mean so many different things, and then even what you choose to focus on within it is is completely different. Uh, Because some people focus very much on the biz dev part of it, and that's not. I mean, I I want to build to bring a business, but it's not. I'm not a salesperson. I don't go out and cold call people or anything like that right that's not what i'm good at i need you to start doing that though Tim, <laughs> I, I need know. you to start making i might get calls, that i might get that, uh, up those phone lines uh the request soon but you know it's not <laughs> it's, it's not what i'm particularly good at i am good at talking to people i am good at networking i am good at uh at thought leadership and and uh, uh I'm, I'm good at listening to clients and, and understanding what they actually have to deal with you know that's what i did a lot of at at hyper island was we're working with a lot of brands as well as agencies. And, you know, when you're working directly with them and you aren't an agency and you aren't trying to sell a creative product, they, they share stuff with you. That's that, you know, the relationship's so different because they believe we've been hired to help them. And so there's nothing in, in between where they think we're trying to sell something that isn't what they need. Uh, the relationship is very, right. very different. And so I, I do think I've gotten very good at understanding how to hear clients and what they're really looking for. And then I know our, what we're trying to do and how to serve that up. So, and that's how I approach that role, but lots of other people might approach that role differently. And, and it's just so different. Whereas at least creative directors in general, 
the role is usually to be the person who oversees the creative teams and 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 then help represent that help help polish the product and then take it to the clients it's still primarily always the same yeah, job I, I guess for as much as change that that has been uh has been yeah, they just consistent. have less time now and there's more layers to it but yeah <laughs> <And some> less <laughs> yeah. glamour less don draper more just chaos yeah totally well, this has been great. Um, Tim, tell everybody where they can find you on the oh, interwebs. Uh, the, the, yeah, my favorite place is actually, is on Twitter, uh, where I'm Tim underscore leak. That's T I M underscore L E A K E. Uh, some jerk took Tim leak the straight word and, and never ever tweets from it. So Son I've been a... stuck with the underscore version. Yeah. Uh, I like that better. If I haven't met people in person, I'm not an open networker on LinkedIn. So by all means, follow me on LinkedIn, but I don't, if I haven't met you, I won't accept the invitation. Uh, it's not to be rude. Why well, you got some real, got some real standards. Oh, Tim. You know, it's just, otherwise I don't actually know my, I don't understand who my real network is. Like I've got a lot of people in there who I've met, who I know and who I want to keep in touch with. And if all of a sudden there's like, I don't know, 200 other people I've never met. Like what's the, it's hard to get yeah, and LinkedIn, I can't believe they haven't solved that problem. They haven't just come out with a way to Dude, separate. Don't even get me started on it. Yeah, that. exactly. I, we'll, anyway. We could do seven whole, seven episode series okay. on how broken LinkedIn is. <laughs> the strategy of, yeah, and yet it's a fantastic tool in, in a lot of other places. Actually, I love LinkedIn, sure. but uh, yeah, Twitter's the best place to get me. There's nothing on my website right now, so I won't give that. And check out rpa.com, our, our, um, the, the agency website. Absolutely. You'll be updating the copy tonight, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, second guess it constantly. <laughs> All right, man. This has been wonderful. Thank you so um, much. It was a lot of fun. Thank you very much. All right. So long. Um...